the substitute. Now there's a couple of things, a couple of foundational matters that need to be attended to. First of all, I, I, I want to once again revisit what God had intended to do when He sent Christ into the world, when He sent this one true Messiah. Now there really is only one true Messiah. That's all there really is. Uh, anyone that God would send as His anointed one, His Messiah, His Christ, this one that was going to do His bidding, would have to fulfill everything that He had said about Him. He would absolutely have to. If He missed even on one point, false Messiah. Don't follow false messiahs. Only one true Messiah and Him the people must hearken to. In Jeremiah 31, 33, this is not my text. I just want to, I, I want to bring this up because, see, this is going to highlight what I have to say today. This is what God's eternal purpose was. This is what He was going to do. You, you, you'll, you'll find an absence of human humanity in this statement. This is what God's going to do. This is not what man's going to do. This is, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law into their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, say, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest, saith the Lord. Well, how are they going to do that, Lord? For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Now, there's not a sound-thinking person in the world that would not agree that that sounds good. This sounds good. God, the great God of glory is going to come, and he's going to take away my sin. Now, flesh says it sounds too good to be true. That's what flesh says. Flesh can't, can't agree with that because it just sounds like pie in the sky. It sounds like it's just too good to be true. Like really there isn't anything that can really help us down here. How will God bring this to pass? Because really and truly, if this is going to come to pass, we can be in agreement and say, God's going to have to do this. This isn't something that we're going to be able to do. Jesus, the whole time he was here, even in the ages past, existed for one purpose. It says, his great desire was to do the will of the Father. Why? Because these, are two, and these two are in agreement. These two are not, they don't have to be taught to be unified. They are unified. They are one in purpose. One. Man's needs were... These, it was not the primary focus of Jesus to address the needs of man. I, this sounds like it, it. Sounds like it. He did the will of his Father. It's much. See, it had to go much deeper than just our temporal needs. Amen. It had to have something more substantial than a temporary need for an eternal God to come down. Amen. Had to have something more than that. The driving force behind the sacrifice of Christ, the driving force now, was in his intense desire to do the Father's will, to please the Father. He said on one occasion, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. His Father consumed his desire. God says, this is what God says now, I will forgive their iniquity and will remember their sin no more. Now, we keep this in the background, ever in the background of our thinking. This is what God's doing. He's taking away that which was in the way so that he can clear the way. Now, now he can do something with man, something productive. Could God just forgive our sins without the sacrifice of Christ? Could he do that? Could God just 
set our sins aside and just pronounce us holy. You say, well, just, just do that. Now Moses penned these words as he was led by the Holy Spirit. In Exodus 34, 7, to answer this question, it says he's keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and it will by no means clear the guilty. God's not just a merciful God. He's not just a forgiving God. He's also a just and a holy God. And this had to be addressed. God's the kind of God that will visit the iniquity upon the fathers, upon the children, and upon the children's children. See, if you're going to take Christ out of the picture, no one can stand in his presence. Amen. Well, let's look at this wonderful eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus to bring many sons to glory. How's he going to do this? See, just looking at it's glorious. Just peering into the work of God is glorious has an effect on men, changes them from glory to glory. It affects your affections and your, your desires. Just, just looking at what God does, it's a picture of who he is. God never does anything independent of his nature, never does anything independent of his person. You never find God acting out of character. He always does everything in full accordance with his eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus. Now this text that, that um, I'm going to fasten on today is in Isaiah 53, 4 through 6. And I'm going to read the text, and it's my purpose, it's my intent, this is my desire, this is what I've been praying for, that God would give me the grace to be able to see what he's prophesied concerning this great Messiah, and to be able to make the connection to the, the Jesus of Nazareth that we've come to worship. Because see, it's that connection, it's vital that that connection be made. It's vital. So many have not made that connection and they're worshiping a false Jesus. And they, they feel as though they have some confidence, but on the day of judgment, he's going to say, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. See, this connection must be made. This one that God has said would come in detail would come and fulfill everything God said, and then we would know, this is he. This is he. Isaiah 53, 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Praise God. Amen. This is the, the work of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Messiah, this anointed one that God sanctified and sent into the world. We're all sinners. We all needed a Messiah. We needed someone to come and take away our sin. Now, the one true Messiah will be equipped by God to effectively minister this to us. Amen. He, God is equipping him that he can come into the world and fulfill the purpose which God's desired. Now, I'm only going to have time to be able to touch on three points out of this text. This is a large text. We all know this. this is, uh, we don't have time to go through every aspect of this. This is large. I'm just going to fasten on three main points. I want to link this to who Jesus is. That one, we're all sinners in need of a Messiah. I mean, all we like sheep have gone astray, haven't we? And number two is the Messiah will have a nature which is free from sin and offense to God. This will be his nature to be like this. And the Messiah will have to be offered by God for our sins. And yet live for our justification and sanctification. Amen. This is going to have to happen. These things are going to have to happen. Now all these points, they must be perfectly executed in order for God to save his fallen creation. Because he's not doing this in a corner, is he? 
He's doing this right out in the open. Principalities and powers are viewing this. The angels are looking into this. So this is going to have to be done very precisely. Now, you would expect this from God, would you not? Will God be able to produce such a man? He had to be a man. An angel couldn't come and save us. He had to be of the seed, the right seed. He would said a lot about the seed. In Psalm 7, 2, 18 says, Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things. Now, you get into the realm of wondrous things, now nah, that's where God is. He only doeth wondrous things. So if your interest is in only common things, then you've got to do it by yourself. And blessed be his glorious name. So he works on behalf of his, his glorious name. And we all know it's for his own name's sake that he's done this. He's making a name for himself. We needed a Savior. We needed a Messiah, one that would come for the express purpose of taking away sin. We're sinners. Now, I know this is not the popular view of the day, is it? Man has a high view of himself in the day in which we live. He's proud and he's arrogant towards God. And men are lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Flesh doesn't take kindly to being told that it can't do what it wants to do. The Holy Spirit is always ready. It's quick to reveal the truth. If a person is honest, the Holy Spirit will show them. It's not him that willeth. It's not him that doeth, but it's God that shows mercy. You didn't work this out yourself, did you? Romans 3.23 confirms what I'm saying. All have sinned. All. In other words, I've never met anyone that wasn't a sinner. All have sinned. And in some time come short. Ah, oh, that's what it says. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Coming short requires a living Messiah. Not just a word spoken from glory. He did this, this, is, this can't happen. God can't speak our salvation into place. He has to send someone. No one else was equipped except the Word. The Word was made flesh and was equipped to handle this. This was a large project God gave him. Coming short requires that he ever liveth to make continual supplication on our behalf. That's what coming short implies. Now, if the provision had only covered the sins of the past, if that's all as far as it went, well, then it wouldn't go quite far enough, would it? You'd be sanctified one day, and then but just a few minutes later, you would, you'd have to start all over again. God have sent somebody else. There was nobody else. He came, and he's perfectly fulfilled this prophecy that God's talked about. Perfectly. The one true Messiah must be able to save to the uttermost those that come unto him. Must be able to do this. Save them. 2 Thessalonians 2.14 says, We have been called by the gospel to the obtaining of the glory of Jesus Christ. So, the one true Messiah, this has to, this has to be the end of our faith. The obtaining of glory. Amen. This is good. This is good. Well, all have sinned, so how are we going to obtain to that? How are we going to get this glory? Well, Jesus, Jesus Christ, the one true Messiah, has come. And he has taken away the sins of the world. All have sinned. And I notice I've said that. This is, this, I want this to be, this has got to be a foundational truth. You can't really get anywhere until this is resolved. We're sinners. We come short. Well, what does that imply then? It implies we need somebody else to bring us to God. Amen. Now, until the need, see, God gave the law so that we would see the need. We have a need. Now, are, are the Jews better than we? Are we? Maybe perhaps we are better than they. Well, Paul, we, not, we need not labor this point much. 
Paul addressed this, and he's even said, What then? Romans 3, 9, are we better than they? No. <laughs> Just move on now. No. In no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. That we're under the curse. We're under it. There isn't any way for us to get over it. We're under it. We're all under sin because we all have the same father, don't we? See, we kind of, we, this is, you want to know what your, you really want to know what your inheritance is in the flesh? You really want to search that one out? Have a lot of confidence in this, huh? Flesh has a lot of confidence in this. Well, the law comes and says, die. That's what you have to do. Death. What's the sentence? Death. You have to die. Why? Because your father was Adam. That's why. This is your inheritance in Adam. We'll divvy it out to all creation. Death. God looked down, Psalms 53, 2. God looked down. You want to know how God feels about it? Let's see how God feels about this. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand. Maybe one. Let's just see. It was there any that did seek after him. Every one of them. This is what he said. Every one of them is gone back. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. If we're going to walk with him in white, something had to change. If we're going to stand with him on that day, and Christ is going to present us to the Father, then God has to bear his own right arm. God's going to bring many sons to glory, then God has to bring many sons to glory. Amen. If it were possible for you to save yourself, well, I can tell you right now, you wouldn't be here. You, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't have a body like this body. Everyone who has a body like this body can't save themselves. It's just the nature that you've been born into. Flesh does not see any benefits in submitting to the idea that flesh is faulty. See, they, this is, you, can't, you can't just coax the flesh into bending the knee. You can't like, okay, we'll have a school and we'll try to teach our flesh that it's really bad. Really bad flesh. Bad. Why? Because flesh. Flesh is contrary to the truth. The truth, the spirit and the flesh are like in a in mortal conflict, one with the other. They're contrary. Flesh and blood will never voluntarily submit to the spirit of truth. It's not going to happen. Your flesh is never going to say, "Come, let's worship the Lord." No, nope. they're contrary. Why do I be laboring this point so much? Because this is why he came. This is why he came. If you were to take our Messiah out of the picture, you cannot produce one valid reason why God wouldn't throw the entire human race into the bottomless pit. There is nothing that we have that we can hold up to God and say, you need to save me because of this. Christ is the only thing we have, and that was given by the Father. That was one with the Father. That was God in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And God cannot deny himself. This is what it took. This is the work that it took. But God. Now, if you see the hopelessness of man, but never forget the God factor. The God factor come up. It grew up before him like a tender plant. This was the God factor. God in man. Man couldn't see the glory of the Messiah, but God did. 
God saw it. What's the Spirit's view on how man received the Messiah? You see, what, what, how did man really perceive the Messiah? In Acts 13, 29, it says that when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. So what, what, did, what did man really think of their Messiah? They killed him and they hanged him on a tree. But God raised him from the dead. That's how God felt about the Messiah. This Messiah never sinned. This Messiah had a different nature. He was, in fact, the perfect, only substitute. He was the only one that God could substitute us, humanity, man, Adam's lineage, if he was going to save man. He, he, if he laid the sins on Adam, well, there would be no saving him. I mean, he could suffer for sin. He could do that. But he couldn't come back. He couldn't come. He couldn't be present with the Lord. So God chose this, this way to save man. He, he sent a substitute, someone that could take their place. And he trained us. He just didn't show up one day and say, I'm the substitute. We wouldn't know what he was talking about. He trained us. He gave us he, all these. You look back there in the time of the tabernacle. Over and over and over. He's training man. What is an advocate? What is a substitute? What is a priest? What is that? He trained man. Trained us up. And even the best of flesh, in the days when Jesus came, even the best of the ones, the ones that he trained, the ones that, that, that knew all about the substitute, and knew all about the prophecies, and knew all about the revelation, they took him and they nailed him to a tree. That was the best flesh. That's what he did. They, they, he they had no comeliness. You just look at him. There was nothing in him that we should desire him. Flesh is still that way. Flesh is still that way. You're never going to coax flesh to, to see something desirable in the Savior. Jesus, although made of a woman, although he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh, did not have a sinful nature. God was his father. See, this, is, this is dawning on me. This was the only way. This was the only way God had to be made flesh and dwell among us. <laughs> his own right arm was, was bringing salvation. Remember in Luke 135, I'm not making this up. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. I'm not making this up. God was his father. He didn't have a nature like you have. He, he, had a, he, came, he was in the likeness of sinful flesh, and he came for sin but his, his father was God. Now you make the connection. Your father was Adam. His father was God. So the Messiah always did those things that pleased the father. See, you can see now how this was, this was his desire. He wanted to please God. Remember when Jesus was baptized? I, I'm, I'm bringing this up because I'm confirming I want to confirm this point about his nature. He didn't have a sinful nature. I'm going to press that issue. Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. That kind of sounds like he went under it, didn't he? And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God ascending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven 
Now, you can't get a better confirmation than this. Saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, how did man look at the Messiah? They said, well, he's smitten of God. How did God? Well pleased. Well pleased. This is my son, and I'm well pleased. The heavens, they could see him for who he was. I even, even his encounter with the underworld, the demons, they knew who he was too. Man was the only one that was, <laughs> was inept and not able to see who he was. You see how dark sin can, can make a person. How flesh, how inept flesh is. Now remember, I just, I just had this side thought. Remember when God boasted on Job? He says, have you considered? <laughs> have you considered my servant Job? Uh, how much more? <laughs> His own son. He's come here. 